Welcome him. Okay, am I, am I uh, amplified? It sounds like it. Okay, good afternoon. So, um, in this talk, I'm going to be using our experiences building Lanyard to describe some of the tricks we came up with for dealing with sort of larger scale development with Django, and also some of the challenges that I think still remain and that the um, Django community and web frameworks like it should still be looking at, at solving. So, just for some context, I'll describe Lanyard.com. Now, I should mention that Lanyard is a large application, but it's not a huge application. This, if you want to talk about discus style hundreds of servers scaling, then you want to find David Kramer. Um, but I think Lanyard's an interesting case study here because it's a great example of an app with a small development team. It's myself doing the back-end development, and Natalie there does the, front, does the HTML, CSS, and design work. Um, building something which is constantly growing, is const is, it's sort of the sweet spot for Django. You know, it enables small teams to build big, interesting applications, start them small, and then grow them as you go along. So um, I think it illustrates a lot of these points very nicely. Now, if you haven't looked at Lanyard yet, uh, I'll give you a quick overview of what it is, just for context. So Lanyard, we're trying to build the definitive database of professional events and speakers. So the idea is that just like IMDB has a page for every film and every film star, we want to have a page for every conference that ever happens, every talk at every conference, every speaker, and build this up for all of the conferences that happened in the past, everything in the future. And we're also looking at... Um, not just conferences, it's sort of evening lectures, it's meetups, it's bar camps, it's all of that kind of stuff. And the reason we want this database is the stuff that we can then build on top of it. So we're already building things like social event recommendation, where we suggest events you might want to go to based on what your friends are doing, um, event networking tools, and an archive of slides, notes, and video of so all of the talks that have, have video and slides released, we're trying to collect together links to those all in one place. So I will jump through and quickly show you a couple of pages of the site. So Lanyard, on the homepage, you can see the big conferences on today. So today it's Open Source Bridge in Portland. There's Europython, of course, in Florence. There's a big Java thing happening in San Jose. But really, we want you to click the yellow button to sign into the site. Because when you sign in with your Twitter account, we look at the people that you're following on Twitter, and we show you events that those people are going to or speaking at. So when I sign in, I get 300, over 300 conferences that my friends are going to, including... Um, I, there's a little jar, there's a coffee script event in Brighton. There's um, Dev slash Hog in the Netherlands. There's all of these different things coming up. This is actually a very effective way of discovering events because it turns out if you follow someone on Twitter and they're going to an event, then it's probably going to be something that you'll be interested in. From the Python point of view, we, we have rich metadata on all of these events. So if you go to our Python page, you can see all of the events we know about that relate to Python. Um, and we also index things like calls for speakers, so we know that there are two Python conferences right now that are looking for people to speak at them. And um, for each conference, we have a page about the event. So here's our page about EuroPython. We know 119 people speaking at the event. We've got all, all 160 sessions. We know where it's happening. And we know who signed up on the site and said that they're attending. So um, uh, I, don't, oh, I don't know if I'm active on the Wi-Fi. I'll just see if that works. Uh, that probably won't work, but we also have a, a searchable directory of people who are at EuroPython that we launched just, just, just in time for the event. And then for each person, we try and build up a profile of all of the talks that they've given. So this is my profile showing talks I'm giving in the future, all of the talks I've given in the past, my speaking history, book credits, all of that kind of stuff. So where LinkedIn has sort of your CV online, we want to have your conference attending and speaking career profile. And then finally, we've got a, a search engine. So if you search for something like Scaling Django, you can see all of the slides, the videos, the talks that people have given about that topic from all sorts of different conferences all around the world. So um, firstly, firstly, then, I'm going to talk about some of the tricks that we've used in Django, which they're probably out there somewhere, but they're not very well documented. So I'm, I'm hoping that they can become more widespread in the Django community and, and beyond. Um, the first trick is one that I'm really excited about at the moment because it's just made it into Django 1.4, and that's um, using a cryptographic signing for various different aspects within the application. So cryptographic signing, if you haven't played with it before, basically lets you take a piece of data, add a signature to it, send it off into an untrusted world, and then when it comes back, you can use that signature to confirm that nobody tampered with it, um, sort of while it while it was out there. So it's fantastic for web applications where you've got like cookies being sent out to people, you have people loading up different pages, you're sending emails. There are lots and lots of useful things you can do with this technique. 
So two examples from Lanyard. First is that we have we send out about 3,000 emails a day with events that your contacts are attending. And we have unsubscribe links at the bottom of those emails. And the, the, those links look something like this. So it's lanyard.com slash un for unsubscribe. And then this big random string. That string is actually a, it's, um, it's a signed JSON object which, with just enough data in it that we know who that person is and which um, account they're unsubscribing for. And there's a signature so that nobody can fake one of those URLs. So when you click on that link in your email, we can quickly confirm, yes, you're a subscriber, this is your subscription record, and give you, you, you the option to unsubscribe. But the really critical thing is that we don't have to store any state to do that. So we send out 3,000 emails, but we don't need to store 3,000 randomly generated unsubscribe links that we emailed out, just so that we can validate them when someone clicks on them. Uh, and a, so a, a related feature is signing cookies. Um, we use signed cookies on Lanyard for one of the most sort of common pieces of functionality on any web application. When you have that little bar at the top that says, hey, you are currently signed in as Simon W. Um, if you do that with sessions, it means that you're committing to doing a trip to your session storage for every single page that anyone views on your site. Like if, you, if that's a database hit, you know, that's, that's quite a lot of additional traffic that you're adding just for that one little feature. So if you, instead, you put the user's username in a signed cookie, then they can't tamper with it, but whenever you see that cookie, you can tell who they are, and you can display that little you are signed in as link without needing to do any um, trips to storage at all. So there are a whole bunch of tricks like that which can really help, when you, especially when you're scaling across multiple machines, when you don't want to have all of the state stored in one place just for, just for little features. And like I mentioned, signing is available in Django 1.4. There are various levels of the API. There's a sort of low-level API where you give it a string and it gives you back a signed string. But my favorite API is this one here, which essentially clones Python's pickle module. So you can take any object that can be represented as JSON. So in this case, we've just got a dictionary. But it can be quite a complex data structure. Um, you call dot dumps on it, and it gives you back a string that looks very much like the string I showed you in the unsubscribe URL. Um, which you, it's, it's got a signature at the end, you can send it around. When it comes back, you call signing.loads on that string and you'll get back the original object. So it makes it really convenient to pass these things around. It's also worth noting that the, by default, the, the strings that it produces are URL safe. There are no special characters in there, it's just upper and lowercase letters and numbers, which means it's really easy to stick them in cookies and send them out in, in emails and put them in, in URLs and all of that kind of thing. Uh, the other API that's quite, quite useful is just the API for working with signed cookies directly within Django. So you can call response.setSignedCookie, pass it in the key and a value, and it'll set that cookie with a signature. And then when you call request.getSignedCookie, it'll validate that signature before it gives you back the object. So it just makes it really, really easy to implement some of these tricks. And the, uh, the code we're running in Lanyard is the code, it's the code I wrote a couple of years ago, which has now been patched and turned into proper, decent, documented code and has made it into Lanyard. So that's the first trick, it's very simple. Trick number two is yet another way of dealing with cache invalidation. I think um, there's a famous quote that there are only two hard problems in computer science. There's naming things and there's invalidating your cache. And so because we've got a whole bunch of caching stuff going on on, on Lanyard, we had to think quite carefully about how we were going to do that. Lanyard's a great example of a site where caching's quite difficult because you have tens of thousands of users who are interacting with the site, they're modifying it. Each one of them gets a personalized view onto the data. And if they change something and then go and look at it and it hasn't changed, they assume there's a bug and they get angry or they keep on changing it or you know, things, things get messed up. So you've got to think quite carefully in that kind of site about how you deal with this stuff. So here's a very simple classic caching problem which we're, which we're solving here. And that's, um, we show, show you a bunch of conferences, that's easy, select star from conferences where Django is one of the topics. But then for each conference, we output the list of topics for the conference. And like, this is an incredibly common pattern. You'll have it with blog, blog entries where you've got multiple authors, all of that kind of thing. But it does mean that you can end up having 20 things on a page and then running an additional 20 SQL queries to pull out those topics. There's tricks you can pull in SQL to make it a little bit better, but it's still, it's, it's pretty inconvenient to, to, to work with that. So what we've done is, um, each of the, we put each of these things into the Django template cache, and then we have a field on the conference object that we can modify to, to invalidate cache entries. So if you consider our, our, this is a straightforward Django model, it's a conference, it's got all of the things on there, and then we have a field called cache underscore version, which is an integer field which starts out at zero. 
then every time the conference is saved, we increment the cache version before we save the conference. And we also have a method that you can call on the conference, the dot touch method, which will increment that key as well. So what this means is that when, whenever we're dealing with templates, um, we can use that conference.cache version as part of our template cache key. And when that conference changes, anything within that fragment will be um, invalidated. So in this case, for those list of, list of topics, we're saying cache for 10 hours um, with a key of conf topics, conference.pk, and then conference.cache version. And then that HTML inside um, loops through, it executes the SQL query and it loops through all of the topics on the conference. But the magic part here, here is that when you, as long as we update the cache version when we add or remove a topic from the conference, these fragments will be all be invalidated across the site with very little effort on our part. And because we're dealing with a cache, in our case we're using memcached, the, the stale versions that aren't being retrieved anymore will just fall out of memory after, 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 after a few minutes. Um, the other nice thing about this trick is it's very easy to do mass cache invalidation um, just by doing a it, So for example, if one of our topics has its name changed, and that means that every conference that displays that topic is going to be displaying stale data, we can run a query that goes across all of the conferences attached to the topic, and for every single one of them, it increments that cache version on the database thing. So what we're doing here then is we're still doing SQL queries. We're assuming that if you're going to show a list of conferences, you're going to have to do a SQL query to get those conferences back, but we're avoiding a whole bunch of additional stuff around the ways in which the conference is displayed by, reply, by, by relying on that cache key. So that trick's been working really well for us um, for the past few months. Trick number three, this is really the big one, and I think this is, this is a pretty large topic, and that's using NoSQL style stores for denormalization. So if you talk to, any, if you talk to anyone about um, like large scale uh, web applications, especially back, backed against a database, one of the first things they'll tell you is that you're going to have to start denormalizing. All of your ideas about sort of normal forms and everything will have to go out the window, and you'll have to start duplicating your data in different places and so on. And this, the way, the, the way I'm sort of suggesting here, doesn't avoid that, it just does it in a slightly different way. Um, I've been following the whole NoSQL thing for, for a whole bunch of years, and I think it's really interesting, but my preferred definition for NoSQL is not only SQL. It's a movement which has really rediscovered the idea that, that the database doesn't have to be the one and only way of storing data. There are other options, and there's this wonderful ecosystem of alternative technologies that all have different niches that they fit into. So I'm a big fan of, sort of polyglot persistence, where you, you, know, you have your data, relational database, you have your other NoSQL things, you spend a lot of time keeping everything in sync, but it does mean that you can get the best of both worlds. Um, to be honest, I, we really like joins when we're doing stuff like Lanyard. You know, it's, um, relational databases are a 40-year-old technology that's holding up pretty well today. And um, a lot of the functionality that we have is, it was really easy to build because we had databases and joins and we could do queries across things. So as an example, if you add some slides to a talk on Lanyard, um, they'll show up on that talk page and they'll show up on the coverage from this conference page, and they'll show up on the slides by Simon Willison page, and they'll show up on the page about slides about Django, all of those different places. And that was just, and that, these are all things that we invented as we went along and we wrote a query and it all worked. I think a lot of the, dis a lot of the frustrations of working with SQL databases, the Django ORM combined with South make a lot of those, those sort of frustrations go away. So we're very keen on, we're very keen on relational databases and in fact, Every, the, we, we consider the, our relational database to be the um, definitive source of truth about everything in the system. If you do that, it becomes a lot easier to think about denormalizations because it's always possible to rebuild um, your alternative structures. So what we're doing on Lanyard at the moment is we're denormalizing our data into two different stores, into Redis and into Solar, both of which um, are useful for different things. So if you haven't looked at Redis, you really should. It's a fantastically powerful tool. And um, it gets lumped in with sort of MongoDB and Cassandra and all of these other NoSQL stores, but I really think it's a very different category of software. It's best described as a data structure server. So Redis is kind of like memcached. It's this thing that sits there on a server somewhere and you talk to it over the network. Um, but it can, and you can put data in and take data out. But all of the data is held in memory. 
and it has support for high-level um, data structures. So it has sort of key, key value pairs, just like um, Memcache does. But it also has the ability to construct sets or lists or sorted sets, things where you can, you can then do data structure operations within Redis. So you can ask it for the top five things in the list. You can tell it to push something on the end of things. And if you've got sets in there, you can actually have it do set operations within the data structure server and then give you back the results. So as an example of what we're doing on Lanyard, we have this feature where you're signed into the site, you go to a page, and there are like 119 speakers there. And we want to show you which of those people you follow on Twitter. So I don't know if you can see, but these ones here have a blue border around them, and there's a little white Twitter bird icon there. Um, and we always put those at the top of the list so that you, you, know, you, you look at a page and straight away you can see, hey, these people who I know are speaking at this conference, they're going to this conference. And the way we do that is using Redis. We actually maintain a whole bunch of Redis sets at all times, um, both for our users and for our conferences. So in this particular case, when I sign into the, to Lanyard from Twitter, um, one of the things we do is we pull the list of people that I follow on Twitter over the Twitter API. And we stash that list in a Redis set, um, which I think we, we keep it around for about 10 hours, and then we'll refetch it if you're still exploring the site. So we stay relatively up to date. Um, that's, so we've got a set in Redis of all of the people that you're following. Then for a conference like EuroPython, we'll have a set for all of the people that we know are attendees. And these sets are just integers, so they don't take up very much space. But then when you hit that page, we can use Python's Redis client. We can say, do a set intersection of the Simon W. Follows set and the EuroPython <laughs> attendees set. And what comes back will be the IDs of people who I follow who are present at the conference. And the magic thing here is that Redis can do something like 100,000 read and write operations a second. So even with just one little Redis server sat in a corner, because everything's in memory, you just this is almost a no-op. You don't have to really think about this operation. It's going to be so fast that you, you wouldn't even notice it. So we use Redis for that. We use Redis for a bunch of other things. It's kind of a, a multi-tool. It also manages our, it manages our um, task queue and things like that. But the, the, a, a much more critical part of our infrastructure um, is Solar, uh, which is a, it's actually a search engine. So I, um, I gave a talk about this yesterday, so you, if you go and look at my slides from yesterday, there's, there's a bit more about this. But essentially, Solar is a web server um, written in Java wrapped around the Apache Lucene search libraries. And it exposes all of the power of Lucene over an HTTP API. So if you're working in Python or Ruby or anything else, you can just talk to it by sending it documents, by running queries with a, uh, by doing an HTTP get against them. And you, it gives you a huge amount of flexibility in, in search. Of course, the, the, the real trick is, sync, is um, making sure that you've got all of your documents in there. But, um, I, but the talk I gave yesterday had a few, few hints for ways in which you can do that. So Solar gives a search. Um, one of the things we do is we stick all of our conferences, all of our sessions, all of our slides and notes, all of the books that we know about, all of our users. And as of a couple of days ago, we're sticking all of our attendees in there as well. So the attendee search that we have on the EuroPython attendee directory is running off the same search cluster. And then we've got a few features on top of that. So obviously we have a search engine. If you search for Django, we'll show you a bunch of stuff around Django. Solar's got, Solar's got very strong support for faceting. So when we, get, we, we do one search, we get back Django. But in the JSON or XML that comes back, it also tells us, hey, if you were to filter by sessions, you'd get 209. There's five books about Django. There's 55 events in the future. It does all of this stuff at the same time. So you can build this powerful sort of faceting interface. But it also means that you can ask questions of the search engine that you'd normally ask through database joins. Um, another thing we do with Solo is we actually use it to power our key feature, the, um, this calendar that shows you where your friends are going to. This is actually a search. I'm asking the search engine for events where the attendees list contains this person I'm following, or this person I'm following, or this person I'm following, up to, I think, 2,048 Boolean, um, like, like or, or clauses in that search. And the performance on that isn't brilliant. It comes back in about half a second. But because, um, because Solo is really easy to replicate, it means we can scale by just replicating it out to more servers. So I think we're running the search index now on four, di we have copies of it on four different servers, and we load balance those searches between them. So the fact that it takes a little while to generate is, is, is no longer a problem for us because we've, we, can, we can scale out with replication. Um, and then the last feature that we're, that we're using Solo for is um, this thing down here. When, when you're on someone's speaker page, um, it has a little list of people who they most frequently appear with. This is really there so that you can sort of browse around the site. You can see somebody go, oh, I'll click on that person and, 
and navigate around. Originally, this was a SQL query, which worked fine when we had 500 speakers in the database. But now that we've got, I think, over 20,000 speakers, that, that query really wasn't working out anymore. Um, so what we're actually doing there is we're doing a search for events that feature, um, in this case, it's Natalie's uh, profile page, events that feature Natalie, but we're asking it to do a facet on other speakers at that conference. We can then trim off the, the top eight results and get them back. It's a very fast query. It's very easy to cache as well. And um, it's a case of replacing something you traditionally do with a database join with a full text search index, which isn't necessarily what you'd expect a search index to be able to do. But the real magic about using things like Solar and Redis is that once you've solved the problem of getting your data into them and keeping it in sync, both Redis and Solar have very strong support for replication. So it's trivial to, if, if, you've, if you've got a whole bunch of um, read traffic, it's trivial to, to, um, to fire up new instances, get a, get a copy of the data on there, and, and, and spread your reads across all of those. So that's trick number three, which is using NoSQL um, to sort of uh, to enhance your database rather than to replace it. But, um, the next trick I want to talk, to talk about is uh, one related to static asset handling. Um, so a huge topic in the web development community over the past three or four years has been client-side web performance, actually speeding up the rate at which the browser renders pages. There are a whole bunch of things you can do around that, but some of the most important relate to how you're serving up CSS, JavaScript, and images, you know, all of the stuff on the page that isn't the page itself. Django 1.3 um, ships with a static assets application that helps you manage this stuff a bit, but the approach it takes I don't th isn't quite sophisticated enough for the kind of things that we wanted to do. So if you view source on Lanyard, um, you'll see that our, um, our CSS and JavaScript links look something like this. It's cdn.lanyard.net slash js slash global dot bunch of, bunch of crud dot js. In our development environment, so our like, actual computer, uh, on, on my laptop, that file's called global.js. So in between it being on here and it being um, up on the internet, there are a few different things that happen to it. Um, so, and so I actually have a management command that, that manages all of this stuff. I have a managed up by push static. It takes the JavaScript and CSS, it minifies it, so it strips out all of the comments. Um, in the case of JavaScript, it runs it through a compressor that renames variables and all of that kind of stuff. Once it's done that, it, it figures out the SHA-1 hash of the contents of the files and renames that and changes that file name to include the first eight letters of the hash. Um, it sticks .js on the end, it pushes up, it up onto Amazon S3, we serve it through Amazon CloudFront so that it's distributed across different servers around the world. But the key thing there is using the contents, using the hash of the contents as part of the file name. That gives you a whole bunch of really useful um, benefits. Firstly, it means that you can set far futures expiry headers because you know that if those files change by a single byte, the file name will change. When you actually serve that out of the CDN, you can stick a thing on it that says, this is going to last for 30 years, doesn't expire until 2021. You can tell the browser that it never, ever needs to fetch that file again, uh, which is great. It's, um, it's, it gives you much, much faster performance because those browsers, you know, once they've retrieved that file once, they, they don't even have to check to see if it's been updated. Um, it also solves a whole bunch of problems in IE, which is notoriously good at caching CSS files, almost to the point where, um, where this kind of trick is required if you want to push new CSS out with new features to people who are running Internet Explorer. But the, the really handy thing for us, um, and the reason we spend a bunch of time on this, is it means that we can deploy those asset files in advance of deploying new versions of our application that rely on them. We were finding that when we were doing deployments, we had problems because we were hosting our static files um, not from the same server as the, the application code, because we had them out on Amazon S3 and so on, we had problems where we deploy a new version of the application, and then we'd have to deploy the CSS at the same time. And if they weren't, they weren't out there at the same time, you get blank pages or you get features looking broken. So this kind of scheme means that we can push the assets up to Amazon S3 before, like, days before we deploy the features that, we rel that rely on them. When we rely on them, they'll already be there. And it also means that the old versions of the files with different file names are still available. So if we do a deployment, something goes horribly wrong, we have to roll back. We don't have to worry about redeploying the asset versions. We know that they'll still be up there. Um, so as I said, I have a whole bunch of dodgy code um, hacked together that gets this to work. I'll hopefully get a chance to wrap that up and, and stick it out at some point as well. So those are some of the tricks that we've been using to, to deal with um, deal with the challenges of, of a sort of relatively large application that's constantly growing. 
What I want, the second thing I want to talk about is some of the challenges that we're seeing, some of the stuff which we don't have good solutions for. I mean, may, maybe some people here do. And things which um, web frameworks like Django could potentially help, um, help solve. So the first challenge is a slightly obscure one, and that's the challenge of making HTTP requests from, from within your application code. <coughs> so these days, any sufficiently interesting application is probably going to be talking HTTP at some point. It's going to be making requests to web APIs. It'll be following up on user requests. There's a whole bunch of things going on. If you're talking to a web API, and it's tempting to just use urllib.url open and off you go. But there are a bunch of things that you have to think about. You have to think about what if that server's down or if it fails to load? What if it's up but it's running really slowly? If your application server spends 30 seconds waiting for an API to return, that's 30 seconds for your user on the front end. And also, potentially, it could tie up all of your application threads and mean that your, your application stops responding entirely. So talking to an API can be... If, you, if, you, if you're not thinking about it, you, you, it can be a, a risky business. Even worse is when you do build features where the user gives you a URL and you then fetch that URL and do something with it. So with Lanyard, we have a feature where you can paste in a URL to SlideShare or Vimeo or YouTube or something like that. We'll then go away, fetch, fetch that URL, try and figure out if it's got an embeddable version that we can stick on the page. If it hasn't, we'll look for the title of the page, that kind of thing. So we do a whole bunch of analysis that's driven by users inputting URLs. But if you're going to do that, there's a whole bunch of, you open yourself up to a whole bunch of problems. What if, the Euro, what if the user gives you a link to a two gigabyte video file? You don't really want your application downloading that somewhere if you don't need to store the file. What if they deliberately give you a link to a tar pit, a server that's set up to respond really slowly in, an, in, in, in a bid to down your site through tying up all of your resources? Even more terrifying, what if you're running something like Solar, which speaks HTTP, behind your firewall? Solar has an IP address that you talk to over it, and a user types a URL into your application that actually points at your Solar instance. So the user essentially uses your functionality to bypass your firewall and start messing around inside your private network. And that's um, something that people don't often think about, but it's actually a, it's a very real problem if you're, if you're dealing with user-facing user URLs. So there's a big challenge here in terms of safe URL consumption. Um, you want to be using connection timeouts by default. If you're running something in production, you want to be logging failures. You want profiling hooks so that you can tell what's going on, tell if services are getting slow. If you're dealing with user URLs, you want to be doing full-on host validation where you like, make sure that they're not able to put in URLs to your internal network. You're only accessing sensible things outside. If you want to be a good HTTP citizen, if you want to be a good citizen of the web, there's a bunch of stuff that you should be doing with HTTP caching, with if and unmatch. If you're pulling RSS feeds, you should be saving the e-tag from that feed and making sure that you don't make a full request every 15 minutes. There's actually quite a lot of sophistication here. And so I personally think that this is the kind of thing that web frameworks should handle. I think this is such a common set of problems that it would be worth baking this stuff into a framework like Django and having... You know, a proper integrated approach, just like Django has a caching thing, having Django have an HTTP client with a standard API where you could swap in different backends, control all of these things in one place, would actually be a really useful idea. Challenge number two, then, is this is a much bigger challenge. This is the thing that's really been, been keeping me up at night. And that's um, profiling and debugging of production systems. If you're a Django developer, you're used to a fantastic development environment for um, debugging. You know, we've got the Django debug toolbar, which is absolutely essential. I haven't done a project in, in several years that hasn't used that. Um, there's the fact that you can just drop assert false into one of your view functions and force the 500 page to pop up with all of the information on the browser environment, the stack trace, everything like that. Again, really, really useful and, and just, just, just a few characters of code to trigger it. And if you want to go one step further, you can drop import pdb, pdb.setTrace, into your view function, hit refresh on your browser, and the applications, your little um, test server will pause, fire up a debug prompt, you can play around with it, and then when you hit continue, the browser will finish loading the page. So you can have a lot of fun um, in that development environment just playing around with all of these things. Unfortunately, the moment you move into production, um, as the Django docs will tell you, you have to set debug to false, which turns off all of this stuff, makes none of this stuff work. And to be honest, as far as someone who's operating an application is, is concerned, that essentially means you're setting debug to blind. You're turning off a whole bunch of the hooks that let you find out what's happening in the system. But the thing is that production systems um, 
but once you get to a certain scale, it's production systems are where the bugs happen. It's where the performance things um, problems start showing up. Your development environment with a few hundred records in the database is not going to behave in the same way as a production environment with a million records and a whole bunch of users writing to different database tables and a whole bunch of stuff going on at the same time. So it's in production that you want to be able to, to sort of introspect what's, what's happening. And unfortunately, because Django has this concept of debug mode that's only available in development, you're kind of left on your own. There are a few bits and pieces out there that really help with this. This is a fantastic piece of middleware which you can find on Django snippets. And all this does is it says, if there's an error and the user is logged into the admin as a super user, then don't return the default 500 page, return the the lovely Django technical 500 response with the stack trace and so on. So if you drop this into your application, somebody runs into a bug, they can send you the URL, you can go there as an admin, and you can see exactly what's happening. It makes it much quicker to, 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 to figure, out, um, figure out bugs. Another trick that I've used um, relates to database logging. One of the great things about the debug toolbar is it logs every SQL query that's run, you can see them all in a big pane, you can figure out what's going on. Once you go into production, um, you can't really run that anymore. So one of, the, one of the things I found is there's a piece of software called MySQL Proxy, which um, you can install it from Packet Managers. Basically, it's a proxy that you send all of your MySQL traffic through. It's very high performance, and then it lets you customize itself in Lua. You can drop in little Lua scripts that, that manipulate your queries or dump out debugging information or whatever. The downside is that it is the single worst documented piece of software I have ever seen. The documentation consists of about two or three blog entries, one of which is 404ing from four years ago. And so you're kind of on your own for figuring out how this thing works. You can install it with apt-get, so at least that bit's easy. But there is a script called log.lua, which is only about five lines of code. It logs out every single query going through the proxy to a file. Um, and I, it's, again, it's available on a URL that I'm not convinced is going to exist for much longer, so I've grabbed it and stuck it in a, uh, a GitHub gist. But it's, it's great. It's, um, so for, there have been a few instances where I couldn't figure out quite what was going on. So I turn on the, um, the logging for the proxy. I tail the log file for a couple of minutes. I turn it off again, and I've got a much better idea of what's happening within the application. Another piece of code, and um, this is something I ended up writing myself, Really, I think it's interesting because it illustrates one of the possible approaches for making this stuff more available. And so I've called it Django Instrumented, but basically what it does is, while a request is running, it starts with a piece of middleware, it collects a whole bunch of different things about that request, so how long it took, um, whether any HTTP requests were fired off in the back end, um, various bits and pieces. And then it saves that as JSON and it stashes it in a memcached key. Um, the key is a UUID that it generates. It writes out the UUID actually in the HTML on the page. So if you view source on a lanyard page, you'll see a meta name equals instrumented at the top with one of these IDs in. And then there's a little bookmark that I've got, which I click, it looks at that UUID, it retrieves the um, profile information out of memcache and it sticks it up on screen. Now I only spent a few hours on this when the site was down and I was trying to fix things. So it's not very pretty yet, but this is essentially what it does. I've got a page on the live site, I click my bookmarklet and it pops up this thing saying, on this page the request duration was 0.6 seconds um, and we made a search query to Solar the search query looked like this, and it lasted for 0.15 seconds. And so, you know, this, I wrote this initially because I needed to get an insight into why certain pages which used search were taking longer to load than others. That query there is actually the query I mentioned earlier that pulls in these appear with bits down the side. Um, and I think, I mean, this is clearly, it's, it's not very exciting yet, but I think the technique of building up profiling information, storing it in, I'm storing it in memcached with a five minute expiration, so if you don't need it for five minutes, it just vanishes. So it's not taking up any space anywhere, and it's a really fast process to, to sort of to store it there so it doesn't affect your loading times. I think there's a lot to be said for that approach. Um, so in terms of improvements to Django, one of the big ones is that debug as a global setting, I think, is an anti-pattern. Um, and I've got a bit of a rant later on about, about related issues to that. There is, I don't think anyone who's ever been faced with a bug in a production system has thought, I wish I had less information about this bug. So the more low-level hooks we have for measuring pretty much everything, SQL queries, HTTP requests, caching operations, anything like that, especially if you can turn them off if you don't want the performance overhead, but you can turn them on when you need them, the more of those, the better. 
And I think something like the Django debug toolbar, but that's designed for live profiling, so that, use it so that you can run all of the time, you've got a bookmarklet that, that gives you the information. Something like that as a third party part of the Django ecosystem would be really useful. And bizarrely, um, a couple of, I think yesterday, while I was uh, thinking, still thinking about this, uh, Jeff Atwood, who runs Stack Overflow, put up a blog entry describing some of the work they'd done around web performance. And one of the things they've got is something they call the MVC Mini Profiler. They've open sourced this. It's, a, it's an ASP.NET thing. And what this does is on every page of Stack Overflow, if you're logged in as, a, as one of the site developers, there's a little thing in the top right that tells you how many milliseconds that page took to generate. And if you click on that thing, it pulls up this profile pane that tells you, again, from real live data running on the production site, exactly how much time each of these different things took. It's an... The thing he said that was really interesting is that once they added this feature, the site performance went way up because all of the developers on their team, they were using the site, they'd see something that was a little bit too high, they'd, get, they, they'd think, I could probably fix that. They'd look at the profiler, find a, a quick win, and they'd, they'd, they'd solve that. It's one of those things where if you measure something and make that measurement visible, then people will just naturally improve it over time. So I think a tool like this for Django would be fantastically useful. The next challenge is the really big one, and that's, doing zero, doing, that's deploying new versions of an application with zero downtime. Um, and this is for code upgrades, this is relatively straightforward. If you're doing database upgrades, this gets really, really tricky. And the ambition is to be able to roll out new versions of your site with radical changes in functionality without a second of downtime where users can't, can't use the site. There are a whole bunch of things you can do here. Um, I'll show you some of the things we're doing with Django, um, but it's definitely an unsolved problem in the large. So the first and most important thing is that you need to deploy your database changes separately from your code changes. Um, the way we, we work is we actually try and make all of our schema changes backwards compatible. So if you're going to add a column and then remove another column, the way you do it is you'd run code that adds the column, which is fine, the new column's there, your old application code is still running, it doesn't need to know about the new column yet, and that's fine. Then you write, um, then you um, either deploy the next column or you write application code that upgrades that stuff in place, so it moves that data around. And then once you've got the app, once all of that's running, you can deploy the next change without affecting the, 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 the code that's executing on the web servers. So we've actually, the way we do this is we, we have one of, our, one of the servers we run isn't running web application stuff at all. It's doing sort of management utilities and so forth. And that means that we can deploy code to that and run manage.py migrate um, on that server to add new columns and so forth without affecting the rest of our cluster. I mentioned earlier um, the importance of being able to do rollbacks. If you're doing this technique, that's, that's particularly useful. Um, being able to um, deploy a new version of your application and then instantly roll back to the previous version, which is very simple to set up using symlinks. I've got some code in, there's a couple of slides in the talk I gave yesterday that describe a very simple way of doing that with Fabric. But the real, the really powerful technique here is having a read-only mode for your application. If you have the ability, either by deploying a new settings.py or by flipping a setting in Redis or something, to flip your entire site into read-only mode, a whole bunch of problems relating to upgrades become a lot easier. So, this isn't zero downtime. We're accepting the fact that for a few minutes, people won't be able to like, update their blogs or add new data to the site or maybe even log in. But the content on the site is still going to be visible to people. And so if you've got this, there's a whole bunch of um, useful tricks you can use. If even if, so if you're doing a really radical database upgrade, if you've got read-only mode, you can flip the site into read-only mode, replicate your production database onto another <coughs> database server somewhere run all of your migrations against that second database server, then um, get that to the point where it's all ready. Then you can point your application servers at the new database and then decommission the old one. And all the time, all the time you're making these changes, because you're on read-only mode, the, the copy of the database that's, that's already sat there is serving up traffic to people. There's no, there are no challenges with inconsistent data because there are no chances that somebody could do a write to database A while database B is being manipulated. Um, you can take this, if you're using cloud computing, if you're using something like Amazon EC2, you can take this to ludicrous extremes where if you're deploying a new version of the app, you can literally clone your database into a new database, then fire up a new cluster of application servers, have them talk to the new database, check them in the browser to make sure that they're all working, and then seamlessly switch your load balancer from serving traffic to the old cluster to the new cluster, and then just throw the old cluster away. 
And that, um, we've used that technique, and I believe there are other companies using that technique as well. It works. It's very simple, and at the cost of a few extra hours of Amazon EC2 servers, it gives you a lot of, a lot of extra flexibility. So read-only mode is very useful. Um, even more useful, uh, although a lot more work to implement, a feature flag. So that's essentially taking this concept and rolling it out further to be able to turn on and off aspects of your application. This is the kind of thing which Redis is really useful for because it can do 100,000 reads or writes a second. So if you've got your, your, your feature flags in there, it's not going to have any performance impact on the application in, in reading those out. But that means you can do things like turn off all of your search-related features while you upgrade your solar cluster. Um, all of the, the, the really big sites like Flickr and Facebook and so on are all using this, this technique. But it is quite a, it's quite a major investment of engineering time to get it up and running. So those are my challenges for, um, for the, the Python web application community in general. Um, I've got suggestions for the first two. I don't have suggestions for this one, but if anyone's got a magic solution that will make um, zero, downtime, zero downtime deployment smoother, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Um, I wanted to end on one lesson which I think we as the Django community keep on learning over and over again. And that's, um, again, it's related to the, the debug setting, these global settings. So Django 1.1, there was only one, way, one place to configure your database. And so if you were trying to set up replication where your reads go to one set, one, one set of databases and your writes go to somewhere else, you couldn't really do it without major hacking. So in Django 1.2, we added um, multiple database settings. There was a huge amount of work to refactor the database thing to talk to multiple databases. Really, really useful. Django 1.3 did it again. We had cache settings where you could only configure one cache. But then people started to realize that with caching, often you'll want to have different types of caches for different purposes. One really good example is you might have some data which is going to last for ages and you want to send that to, um, to a sort of dedicated cache cluster. Whereas you've got other bits of data where it doesn't matter if it gets refreshed every few minutes. So you, you, you want to put that in something else. But you want to make sure that the big data going into one cache doesn't cause the data in the other cache to get flushed out because you run out of room. So there are a whole bunch of reasons that it makes sense to have multiple caches. Um, Haystack is a Django application that we use to talk to Solar, the search engine. Fantastically useful piece of software. It lets you talk to Solar and Woosh and Zapier and all sorts of different search indexes. But again, it only allows you to configure one search index at a time. So the next version of Haystack that's coming out hopefully, hopefully quite soon has multiple backends uh, modeled on Django's MultiDB where you can configure multiple search servers and talk to those. So, this is a pattern that keeps on coming up. And unfortunately, there's still stuff in Django which suffers from this kind of problem. I've already talked about the problem with debug being this single global setting that affects all sorts of things, when actually it's not really what you want to be doing. Um, the time zone sitting in Django utterly horrifies me. I don't know if anyone's run into this bug, but it's possible, especially if you're running more than one Django application on the same Apache server, which thankfully we're, I, I'm not doing for anything anymore. It's possible to have different time zone settings which affect the timestamps in the log files. So your Apache log file ends, ends up coming out with like one thing from five hours ago, another thing from now, and another thing from five hours ago, depending on which Django application was last executed. It's a horrible, horrible piece of... Um, piece of mang mangled settings in there. And the one that worries me most is, is middleware. Django has middleware. There's a fantastic array of stuff. It's very powerful. But middleware, you, you, you apply it, and it, it gets run on every single request to every single part of your site. If you want to run it conditionally, you have to have the middleware itself decide on every request if it's going to execute or not. And again, I don't think that's something that really scales up. I don't think having a single global setting for something like that, like that is useful. So as a general rule, Global settings need to be flushed out of the project. And um, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Agreements. Pow power to the people. And um, I think as an addendum, any setting in there should, ideally it should be modifiable at runtime as well. This is something we still don't do very well. But um, one of the reasons WordPress, um, the blogging software, is so popular is that you can install it on your server. The first time you go to it in your browser, it asks you to enter your database settings. You know, there's a lot of things. If you're, if you're talking to a cluster, being able to dynamically configure an application at runtime to start talking to a new database server you've just set up or a new caching instance that just come online is actually really useful. So I'd go a step further and say not only a global settings evil, but settings that you can't change from the change at runtime within the code of your application uh, are evil as well. So that's everything I had to, to talk about. Um, I should mention if any of the things that you've seen in this talk 
utterly horrify you as a developer, then please come and talk to us because we are hiring and we want to get developer and web operations people in to take all of the code that I've written and, and make it sensible and, and sane and, and, and keep, on, keep on doing what we're doing. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Yeah, there's one at the front. Um, I have um, a question about Python 3. Oh. Is there a schedule about the date when we can use Python 3 with Django? I have absolutely no idea. Does anyone know when Django is going to work on Python 3? Yeah, I know. Um, Janice there can <laughs> answer that. Um, so Alex Gainer started to uh, do some work on that, and I talked last week with Martin van Lewis, who did a quite a lot of work last, like two years ago about that. Um, and the current plan is to work on this during the summer, slowly migrating parts of the trunk to Python 3, and then figuring out actually how to, you know, how to <laughs> do this kind of stuff. It's kind of a big, big messy work. So. I don't think before 1.5 at all. Okay. A question about invalidation of external data. Um, you have quite deep Twitter integration. How do you huh? deal with profile changes? So the way we deal with profile changes at the moment isn't ideal. Um, Every, basically, every time you sign in, we have to do a call to Twitter as part of that sign-in process. So when you do that, we re-fetch your Twitter information and we update your record then. That's kind of unclear and people ask about it occasionally. So the other thing that we've just done is, as of a couple of days ago, you can actually edit your profile on Lanyard. So you don't have to have your Twitter bio as your bio on your conference page, which is kind of good because a lot of people, their Twitter bio says, like, I won't follow you back. And then you go to lanyard.com and there's a bunch of their talks and it says, I won't follow you back at the top, which doesn't make much sense. So we do actually have our own concept of a, of a bio now as well. And we will shortly be adding the ability to up, upload recognizable photos of yourself for the attendee directory. So you don't have to squint at somebody's bizarre little Twitter avatar and try and figure out what they look like. Any other questions? I'm going to get, I, I bet I can get another question out of people. There's one right at the back, I think. Yeah. I should mention that um, the slides for this talk will be available at that address as soon as I get a working internet connection. Uh, regarding cache, uh, hashing of uh, stat uh, static files, CSS and JavaScript, mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with including those files in the templates after you've changed the file name. Right, I'll show you, I'll pull up some code for this. That? Basically, it's, it's all a bit of a tangle, but it does work. So um, let's pull up uh, base.html. So we basically, we have a custom, um, custom template tag we wrote called S3 static tag. I don't know, is this legible at all? Um, a little bit, yeah. Uh, hold on. <coughs> well, it's. I just need to grab. Uh, there we go. So I'll gr just grab this out and show you it separately. Um, <coughs> um, so that should be a bit more legible. Basically, we have a tag that looks like this. Um, and this does a couple of things. If you're in development mode, it actually adds question mark random number on the end so that every request to the development server is a fresh version of CSS. You don't have to worry about cached CSS when you're developing things. In production, it um, looks up this uh, file name in a dictionary in, in a um, dictionary that we write into the settings file when we deploy the app to find out what the name of that file will be after it's been, after it's been changed. So in this case, look it up in a dictionary, it'll see that it's now called jQuery 1.4.3.randomstring.js, and it'll, it'll write that out with cdn.lanyard.net at the beginning. Um, 
And the other thing that we had to do, which is a little bit awkward, is our CSS files make references to images in them, you know, background hyphen image colon URL blah. So we actually have a dodgy little reg regular expression that reads in the CSS file and replaces any of those with the updated version of the, of the file name. So it's all a bit hacky, but it, it has been working pretty well for us. Thanks. Um, there's another question right at the back. Hi, I was wondering if you'd heard of Django Compress, which does pretty much the same thing, and if you, ha if you have, why didn't you use it? No, I haven't. What is this? Uh, Django Compress, it minifies CSS. Oh, Django Compress. Yes, I looked at it, and I can't remember why, but there was just one tiny little thing in there where I goes, eh, it's not quite what I want to do, so I rolled my own. Also, um, we were in Luxor in Egypt, and Nat was really ill, and I had nothing else to do, so... It felt like a good time to, to reinvent static, static file handling. But yeah, it's quite possible that that does exactly what I want, but I seem to remember there was one aspect of what I was doing that wasn't quite right, and so I ended up, ended up reinventing the wheel. Does, does it do the SHA-1 um, uh, hash in the file name trick, then? Oh, no, I don't like that at all. No, that was it. That would have been it then. Yeah, the, um, the problem with modified times is then you're dealing with people on different computers and all that kind of thing. And the, um, if you use a hash of the contents, you're just absolute rock-solid guarantee that if the file has changed by a single byte, there will be a new file name up there. So it, it just feels like the, the, the best possible way of dealing with that. Um, I think we're nearly out of time, but I can probably take one more question. Yeah. Okay. One more question. Yep. Here you go. <laughs> so um, a couple things you mentioned were hard that are pretty easy. Um, Janice, <laughs> I guess, mentioned there's a, a read-only package for Django that seems pretty awesome. Oh, sweet. Um, and feature Oh, is that one of those ones which um, intercepts all posts and assumes uh, It wraps the blocked. cursors. Um, <laughs> it so wraps what? It wraps the cursors, and I assume it does what we do, which propagates up an exception to the middleware. Okay. and says you can't do this. Yeah, you um, still, the thing is that's kind of horrible for users. You kind of want to give them a warning before they click submit that they're going to be told off. So sure. really you want a, a flag in the template. We say if in read-only mode, display this message instead. And that just ends up being hassle, but you have to do it. And the other one is uh, feature switches are really easy in Django. Um, we open source a package called Gargoyle, which just magically works and it scales like no other. So. Awesome. Is it Redis? Uh, it's not. But it ah. is very, very efficiently cached um, through memcache and the database. Oh, cool. Um, okay. And there's actually a Redis backend for the backend that it uses, so it could be. Excellent. So have a look at Gargoyle then. Oh, okay. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.